Um, hello and good evening. Welcome to Transport Talks with AGO. And today we'll be speaking about equity in transport. So someone once said, um, the greatest threat to our planet is to believe that someone will save it. So I would say the greatest threat to um, our transport system is to believe that someone will save it. So we have to decide and make the transport what we want it to be. Uh, okay, so before I proceed, um, we have with us with us Daniel, Daniel Betule, he's a receiver engineer and also um, had a master in transport engineering. We also have with us, um, Mumbubu is a land um, public transport researcher and from South Africa. So um, our third speaker is about to join us. We'll be coming in late. So um, so we'll just proceed with the discussion. So um, let me start with um, Daniel or um, any of you. When you said what's the difference between equity and equality, I think that's a good place to start. Yeah. So maybe Daniel, anybody can. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to take that. Um, I find I find with such a, a question that there's a popular picture, quite a popular one that sort of explains what the key difference may be. And I'll crave your indulgence to just pop that up. I'll just check that you can see my screen now. Yeah, can, I think so. Brilliant. So as with almost every area of life, not just limited to transport, um, on the left-hand side, what you can see is um, a picture of a family, and they've gone to the stadium to see a game. Um, on the left-hand side, they've been given a stool to watch the game from behind the fence. So what this image tries to show, and I think it's a powerful description of the question you just asked, is yeah. on the left-hand side, they've been given equal stools without any consideration towards whether their height or whether they require special needs. But on the right-hand side, you see they've been given, the lady has been given two stools. The man's height is sufficient enough for him to view the game without having to stand on any platform. And there's been a ramped platform provided for the character in the wheelchair to be able to view the game. And so to answer you simply, equality is providing, quality in transport is trying to provide access, equal platforms as much as possible for all user groups, while equity, which is what we are often tending towards, yeah. is recognizing the needs of different people and providing the best platforms for them to assess these transport needs. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Mama, before you add to that, um, um, to, to our um, audience, could you please just quickly uh, um, tell us where you're joining us from, your country, and that would be very helpful. So just uh, type on the chat box where you're joining us from. Uh, so, so Mama, do you want to add to that, or should we just proceed? Nothing is like I agree with Daniel that equity has to do with same same resources given to people, whereby equality looks at different circumstances. I I fully fully agree with Daniel. Okay, okay, that's that's so interesting. Now, while we wait for our, our um, audience to like drop on the chat, where the journalists from, I so let's come to like the African context. Yeah, because Daniel, I believe you're. So from Nigeria and then we move from South Africa. So you can actually give um your examples using um wherever you want to. So and let's come to Africa. So what do you think? Do you do you think first of all? Do you think um where 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 where, where is our transport system? The, where do you think we are in terms of equity? Do you think we are we are there or we are about to start or we are moving? So what do you think? If I go first. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Um, as with the rest of the world in terms of where we are with our transport or where we are in, including equity in the way we travel in Africa, I see we are at the very um, start of the process. And I say this because of 
when you look at the modal shares between all the transport firms we have back home, it appears that there's still a lot more that can be done. And so while I recognize that there are already efforts trying to improve equity in access to transport, I'll see we are still at the foundational stage. Okay. So can you like give us an example? I think that will help. Yeah. For instance, where I come from in Nigeria, uh, and where I stay currently in Leeds, it's literally a tale of two words. Okay. Because yeah, I'm wants to find people traveling or commuting for their basic needs, shopping, um, to walk, to school, using a bicycle. And from where I come from back home, it was only ever a case of using it as um, a travel process, uh, I'm sorry, for leisure or for a means to exercise. And so you find that people who, are, who would otherwise not be able to afford the car have to use or have to spend, you know, so much accessing public transport when you know, there are cheaper alternatives like the bicycle. And so in such a case, you find that transport poverty um, becomes a problem in these areas. And so, yeah, even if, you know, we are at, you know, the starting point of these things, there's still a lot more that can be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, um, what about, do you, I know he has, not a issue, but um, could you like respond to the question? Okay. I sorry. Um, I I don't think in Africa that I don't think that in Africa there is uh like transport equality. I often say we don't we like we can never even describe as as transport equality in Africa, but we can even describe it as transport poverty. Because um, I would make emphasis of what Daniel just said. Um, transport, transport poverty has to do with one, spending so much resources for, for their travel. And if you, if, if you then look in terms of uh, like Africa, we, we, we can never even we, we can never even speak about transport equality. We rather speak about transport poverty because when you talk about we would like if you talk about equal, uh, transport equity, maybe in Europe and America you would be talking about that, but in Africa, I I, I, I beg to differ that there there is transport equity, but what exists in africa is transport poverty okay okay um thank you for that um before i move on um please to our audience can you guys open the chat box um where you're getting us from yeah and that would be very helpful okay um you can see shuwa there from uk you can see it from nigeria you can see esther from nigeria thank you so much for joining us okay so back to um daniel and Mumbo, you can any of you can decide to answer. So now, what do you think the problem is? Because now, um, from the first image that Daniel showed us um, about the, the the people getting support to watch a match, so we have we have well, this is, we have um, diverse kind of people in, in Africa, for example. So um, we have the low class, the high class. We also have people, women. We have kids. We have the disabled. We have different kind of people. So um, what do you think is the problem exactly? Um, if I can take that first. So I would like to emphasize that um, the problem is not just, the problem with transport equity is not just limited to Africa. It's an ongoing global debate. <laughs> and, and yeah, so there are all shades of nuances to um, the sort of problems we have in transport. And I'll just leave a few. To achieve equity in transport, it's, it very much has to be an integrated process at all levels. We have you, the transport planners, we have the transport engineers, government legislators, and everybody actually working to achieve this, the people with special needs. But you find that in most transport projects in Africa, um, 
very little is done to actually make sure that there's that synergy between all these groups. Um, where they are designing roads, for instance, in my experience designing roads back home, you find that there are no hard legislations, for instance, that that ensures that roads are designed, you know, with um, proper walkways. And you find sometimes people just design the roads, put the drains by the side without any consideration for pedestrianization around that area. And so in such a case, you find it may be, it may be a problem with the legislation that does not ensure that every single road or every single carriageway design within such a country has these provisions. You find that it's also a case where the consultants have not, in a manner of speaking, factored these considerations in. Or even if they do, they've done so to cut a quick buck. You find that perhaps even in the design of such infrastructure, they've not asked people in those communities. They've not <laughs> taken proper studies into seeing what would you like to do? Would you like to see proper walkways? Would you like to see cycleways? How safe would you want this infrastructure to be? And so I would say, I would say the problem, just broadly speaking, is a case of having that synergy. And I think it is that synergy that is lacking in ensuring transport equity. Okay, okay. Um, but before I get to you, um, I want to speak to say to our audience, please when I quickly let me make this quick pop up. Um okay. So when you when you when you see um see the word equity, what comes to mind? So can you just type on the chat box um three words that come to mind when you see the word equity? So I know it can be in transport, it can be in non-transport, but when you see the word equity, what comes to mind? You can quickly just drop that on the chat box as we're listening to Mobobo. Okay. Um, Mobobo, I think you should unmute yourself. Um, okay. I fully fully <laughs> I just unmuted myself. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we can hear you. The problem of I fully agree with Daniel that the problems of equity does not exist in Af in Africa. Uh, in, of inequality in transport does not exist in Africa alone. Yeah. But I would also take this in mind. What happened? Um, what happened in 1998 in terms of the U United States um, federal government? What they did is that they spent a lot of, uh, they, they spent 200, uh, 200, 200 billion in uh, US, US dollars in, in financing their Transport Equity Act. That project went from two, two, 1998 up until 2003. When Congress when were unable to then even decide on how to allocate budget in terms of equality to transport, what they then did in two, in two thousand and five, they, they they amended the act into the Safe Transport Equity Act. So you 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 would then see that to achieve equity in, into transport, the the, the government had to make decisions and those decisions needed then then made transport better in like in the united states so when you come to africa in terms of risk, like allocation of resources we i believe researchers i believe government um, i believe that government needs to to make studies and in terms of st studies i don't think uh, they need they needs to be only engineering studies i also feel that there needs to be proper research in terms of how does one policy then impact people in terms of their social needs Oh, okay, okay. So, um, thank you for that. And let me quickly respond to our chat. So, we ask a question: What three words comes to mind when you see the word equity? And Jenny Martins um, mentioned fairness, opportunity, 
and engagement. So before we go, to, and she also has a question which she dropped in the chat. So before we go to the next chat, um, so our speakers, if you don't mind, can you just quickly address this? So she said, fairness, opportunity, engagement. Do you like agree with that? Do you think there's more more than that, or do you? What do you think we are in this in those places in terms of like as an as a continent, Africa, or we can use your country, Nigeria or South Africa, anyone? I mean, did, did I make myself clear? <laughs> Yeah, um from like i agree with the three terms added in terms of fairness because uh mm -hmm. equ equity has to do with fairness and as like i love the way daniel started when he was starting he showed us a very nice picture that showed the difference between equality and equity so i like he, he he when he was then describing he did emphasize that um equity has to like you you need to identify that different people have got different needs and when different people have got different needs you you then need to give them proper resources that will make will will will, will raise their equity Okay, thank you so much. Um, so let me like drop Jenny Martin's question before we proceed. It's like says a chat and interaction. She said, get comments on the consulting with local communities from planning road projects. So, what is the best way of doing this? How do you make sure all views all view points are ahead? So, um, I really want to because I think you mentioned that comment. We want to um say something about that and also yeah. moving and yeah, 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 yeah. I'm happy, I'm happy to think that. Okay. Um, so yes, in, in, in planning the delivery of any infrastructure, the public engagement part is a very crucial aspect of any planning process. Um, I told you the first question, what is the best way of doing this? I'd, I'd say the best way of doing it is just do it. You know, <laughs> okay. go, go to those communities, um, find representatives of different groups, are there people with special needs living in these communities? Because I assure you they exist. Oh, of there's, a town, there's a town leader, there's a council leader, yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a religious leader, there's every, all, sorts, all sorts of people. And so while you're making a study, at the same time when you're planning the feasibility of such a process, it makes sense to start to think of the stakeholders, mm -hmm. who the projects will affect, which people will pass through their lands, their storefronts, the shop owners around those areas. So have an idea of what the stakeholders for those projects will be um, and engage them, really. Yeah. Ask them, have a town hall meeting, have a community-based led design, have those things. Let them hear, hear their ideas, hear their concerns, what their aspirations are regarding those projects, and take it into account. And so that's what I would say um, is the best way to do it. And the final point she has asked, how would you resist lobbying? I mean, with these things, it's always going to be a trade-off. Um, it's always going to be a trade-off. And I, I remember a friend telling me, recently in the public engagement consultation she had in Manchester. And she said, they asked the people um, what their aspirations were in terms of the delivery of the project they were going to have there. And, and most of the people went like, um, I don't know what you're talking about. And there was one council member, however, who said he wouldn't want, you know, um, cycling infrastructure because that was the case there. He would want cycling infrastructure taking up the road space and, soft, and all sorts of things. So I think, there will always be lobbying, there will always be resistance. The idea or, or the key point would be to sort of strike a balance. Once people once people see that there's a merit or there's a merit to a project and it goes beyond reasonable doubt, I think the acceptance will follow. I hope that's been helpful. Okay, thank you so Jenny. much. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm getting matters. I hope that's answered the question. If not, you can still like um send us a chat and we try to respond more. Um, so Mamuba, do you want to add to that or do you want to say something um related to that? Then there's there's one inference. There, there's one emphasis that uh the disabled community the disabled community always says nothing for us without us. Oh, you just read my mind. I was so, about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> they always say nothing for us without us. So, as Daniel has said, you need to include everyone. Okay, 
Okay. So, um, so apart from the fact that um, you need to um, include um, everyone, like the stakeholders, going to the community, asking them what they need, um, let, let's um, go to the um, public transport or let's go to the mini taxis. Um, um, so this, this, this should go to Mumbu because you are the mini taxi um, expert. So what, what do you think? Because um, I'm not in South Africa, you are the one in South, South Africa, and you are the expert. So um, let's come more to um, the South African context. What exactly do you think is the issue and what do you think can be done in terms of equity? In terms of equity, because like if you look like if you look at our history as South Africans, we we were under a colony for a very long time, and um, we were whereby uh, there was like the, the black people were not treated the same way as white people, whereby women were not treated the same way as men. Uh, in terms of the minibus taxi industry today, we've got a lot of men. Um, that's whenever, whenever you can even search about the South African minibus taxi industry, you'll see a lot of violence, uh, violence and killings. This is because there's no, there's no equality in terms of resources. You would find that one person is, is richer than the other in order for for that for for the person that's not rich he would need then to consider violent ways or reckless ways to then destroy to then to to then to then gain the seat that 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 person that rich person is having and in terms of in south africa in terms of land public transport there are three modes of, of public transport which is uh, you've got your trains you've got your buses and you've got your minibus taxi industry you find that government is sponsoring like it's subsidizing the two which which is the train and also and and also the the, the bus industry, whereas you find that uh, the minibus taxi industry is just privately owned, you like, and those people have got limited resources in terms of finance. So, like, what can be done? I believe that if the South African government and the sub, like I, I would rather say, I believe that if if governments in the sub-Sahara are really serious about public about public transport, they should then subsidize everyone. Because why subsidize someone and not subsidize the other one? And in South Africa, it's actually very very painful because you find that the minibus taxi industry it carries more than seventy percent of the population, but. It's like the government does not subsidize it. Hmm. Okay, that's quite interesting. Okay. Um. Oh, sorry. Are you done? If you want, to, are you done? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Um. Daniel, would you want to give us a respect to like the Nigerian contest? Or yeah. Yeah. Or, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about it then. And I'll just double check that I understand what your question is. You please do, yeah. You've you've asked what whether mini transport meets transport. Yeah, yeah. So so how should be the the the, the downfall, um the BRT, uh, yeah. yeah, the public transport in general, yeah. Whether the public transport, yeah. I'll I'll see I'll see there are key issues that would need to be assessed, really. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a case, like he said, I'll just add a few to the things he said. You see, in achieving equity, um, it's important also to achieve equity in the structures that actually serve such a public transport. And like he said, the employment force, you need to check, um, do we have male-dominated drivers? Do we have people with special needs driving? Because it mm -hmm. is in having it is in having a diverse workforce that you would have diverse perspectives. Very true. And having diving, diverse understanding that would serve you know, this different needs. Um, do we are they accessible? Do they serve all areas, or are they just concentrated in particular locations? Um, do do they have transport lines going 
I'm not familiar with Lagos, but I'll try to give an example. Like, do they have transport lines running from Okokomaiko to, to Victoria Island? Do they do they do they serve those purposes or do you know car sharing schemes are they concentrated to a particular location? Do they sometimes reject calls for ride at different locations? And so it might be a case that we also have to look at the legislation in place, at the legislation that makes sure that people do not hike prices indiscriminately. Um, are the legislation to make sure that you know no user of these services is discriminated against, and so it's checking this. It's in checking these aspects, and there are a lot more that will be checked yeah. that will you know give a sense of where we are um, in terms of achieving equity in mini mini transport. Yeah. So I think I think in this case I've avoided giving a simple answer of yes or no. Yeah. But I'll yeah. ask that you check. Yes. Yeah. I something else I like, think um I find this quite interesting that none of you actually went beyond land transport. I know yes, of course, civil engineer and um land is far, but I think there are other parts of transport than just land. There is the water, there is the rail transport, there's the air. Why is nobody saying anything about that? So I are we it doesn't imply that those parts are like everything is fine. <laughs> yeah, by, all, by all means, I think I think there are problems with every um, every transport mode. But I can imagine we are we are focused on land because as transport estimates from around the world will show nearly eighty percent of passenger trips happen on land, particularly yeah, on roads. So yeah. Okay. Um so remember, yes, you sent an interesting um, picture. Do you, do you want to um, talk about it? Should I share it? Yes, you can share it. Okay, great. Okay, I think it's being shared now. Yeah, we can see we can see this, the the pictures you want to see. Okay. Yeah. Just want you guys to look at the screen and ask yourself: When last did you walk to school, or when last did you walk to work? This is a story of of a young girl in Kenya. This young girl each and every morning she has to wake up in the wee hours of the morning. She has to do her home chores and she has to do, she, she has to walk 13 miles. I'd like you to share the next, uh, the next picture. This is the story of a young girl in Tanzania. Her name is Sylvia and that's her mom. Sylvia, like the previous girl, she has, she, she experienced more or less the similar experiences, but you might you 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 might you you would see that in the picture Sylvia is smiling, and you might ask yourself why is she smiling. <laughs> Sylvia considers <laughs> Sylvia cons, considers herself lucky because she's able to go to school. The stats given by the World Bank will tell you that there are more than twenty uh, nine million girls in, in Africa that are not going to school because they are unable to go to school because um, it might be because of, okay. it might be because of, uh, okay. <laughs> sorry, it might be because of not having, uh, not having access and not being able to afford to go to school. This is a picture that was taken in South, in South Africa. It was about, two, two, it, it, it was about four years ago. Then what then happened? What then happened was was that these kids, in order for them to to reach to school, they had to go through the river. That's yeah. each and every time I'll tell I'll tell you that in Africa there is no transport equity, but there's transport poverty. I think you can share the next slide. This yeah. picture is the same. This picture is, uh, is part of the uh, um, is, is the same picture that I've I've, I've shared. Is a continu continuation of the same picture I've shared of Sylvia. 
Imagine what Sylvia has to go through to get to school. Through all these bushes, I'm sure there's a snake sitting somewhere. But her determination to go to school is bigger than everything. I'd like to you to share the, the next, I think it's the last picture, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's the last picture. Yeah, then there's, imagine having to walk and imagine having to walk such a journey to school. And one sad part is that we, 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 we do have resources in Africa. We do have resources. Only if we can start spending and allocating those resources in the right manner, I believe we can change the we can change the lives of the kids in Africa. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, this uh, <laughs> this um, image just reminded me of um, a conversation I had with one of my friends. I think one from India and one from um, I think from the UK also. And I think we went for like a hiking or something. I was like, oh no, no, no that this is this this work is so long you don't do this kind of work long okay so i so yeah yeah i it's, it's kind of like how like the word it's um it's sad yeah it's sad um daniel i, I do you want to like you want to re respond to that this end of this image um i know this yeah. is okay please go on sorry yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to um i just want to say that i mean whenever such images come up in public discourse um it's a, it's a sad sight yeah and i think for most people we can empathize with the situation um yeah um on the Let continent to you, sorry to interrupt you a bit it's so sad because this is the 21st century there are some things we should have possibly had gone by this by this level yeah. Yeah, on, our, on our on our dear continent i do admit that there is a lot more that can be done in terms of um, having Trans, uh, you know, equitable transport and having access to transport for all people. Um, but in doing this, I do not want to underscore some of the important work that countries around Africa are doing yeah, to ensure that work. transport, yeah. you know, transport equity. I think, I think the, the point of uh, disagreement with my dear colleague would be that you, you cannot simply, you cannot simply draw parallels between developing countries and much developed countries our, our states for instance and you, you do make it make a nice example with what you were trying to describe when you went hiking with your friend um in certain, in certain areas of england uh, the public transport or the access to public transport in these areas are poor and so for them it's it's the case of um very remote areas you know in um, in the countryside, not having access to good transport. It's, it's an equity problem for them as opposed to cities, right? And so for us, it's on a much larger scale, like a girl having to walk 13 miles to school. Um, but, yeah. it does not, but it does not completely remove, you know, attempts, foundational attempts, I would like to add, that have been introduced in the past. I would say this, for instance, where, when I was a child growing up in Lokoja, I know there were several schemes by and the government to have free buses, um, you know, uh, conveying children to school at no cost, and trying to provide that kind of succor. But I also do recognize that such a chance was perhaps not given to um, a similar child who grew up in the Kina. Um, and so I would say, yes, um, there's the challenges I loved. There are a lot of challenges that we will have to overcome. But yes, we are at the foundational stage and with the right you know the right um, sort of conversations like the ones we are having on such a platform i believe that type of change will be realizable yeah yeah um so before um um if you want to that, i just want to say something um the part of the essence of this uh, also to create awareness and also enlighten the public as i have mentioned but you know that some some of us apart from transport experts the people in the transportation sector some people that actually know the impact of of, of a lack of equity or, of, or lack of access or a transport that is, doesn't um, provide um, equal opportunities to everyone so can you please help us just briefly any of you just make um, the public understand the impact 
of such um, situation in any society or community or, or economy, if you understand what I mean. When it, 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 yeah, so can you just put it just at an impact so that maybe you can start understanding the, the significance of this topic? And I can, I can, I can share something. So, I think, I think, I think for most people who have traveled, you know, to developed countries, there's there are several stories of cultural shocks yeah, that cut across, that cut across um, different aspects of life. And I'll just share a personal experience. Once, once I was in a, I was in a supermarket doing grocery shopping, and um, I noticed someone come in, come in, just with a dog. You see, and they were walking. Um, you know, making their daily grocery shopping needs or weekly grocery shopping needs, as the case may be. You see, but the thing I could not point out immediately was that this person was blind, and that that was a, and that that was a guard dog. Um, that was I don't know how that works exactly, but this person was able to travel, you know, unaccompanied um, with that guard dog, and perhaps with the cane. I can't remember the exact things. You find that, you find that. In many cities in England, and perhaps for most developed countries, the the infrastructure, the transport infrastructure, is designed in such a way that it, as much as possible, tries to include um, all users, everyone. You find that people can travel, you know, from their home to the shop to school, just with a cane, right? I only ever found that to be the case in the university where I was in Nigeria, University of Nigeria, because um, I think to, to, to a reasonable extent, university environments have reasonable infrastructure for that, that serves all these needs. So, but you would find that for a typical street um, back home, that people cannot walk unaccompanied, even if they had kids, because perhaps the, the, the walkway has been overtaken by roadside vendors, um, <laughs> perhaps they are non-existent. Uh, and so what you find, what you find that you've done, you know, by not ensuring, or what you find, what you find the cost of not ensuring, you know, the proper or the, the right access to transport infrastructure is that you're excluding people. You find that you're excluding people, you find that you are reducing um, their experience of what life should be. And so I would say the most important thing of not, or the most important downside of not having equity in transport is that you, you, you run the risk of excluding different user groups. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, you just, you, your, your statement made me recall what happened to me. I think about some years back, I went to, we had the called National Youth Service after your graduation. I went to university to serve and I observed that, um, so after, after um, lectures, most of the students cannot get back home so they either walk back home or wait for hours. And so yeah, I know people might think this is just um transport um um transport um uh, but this thing was it affects their study because when they get back home so exhausted and tired, they might not have time to do their assignment or not have time to even study, and they'll go back the next day and do the same process all over again. So and this at the end of the day might affect the kind of graduate to produce because the trans transport affects every part of your life. Everybody uses transport. Whether you are um, whether you are a market woman, whether you are a teacher, whether you you work in the office, even if you don't use public transport, the fact you have a car and you are still on the road, it's so it it affects everyone. So yeah. So um, do you want to add to that? Do you have anything to say? And to our audience, yes. have, um, questions or comments, please open the chat. Thing is, if you look at the impact, um, I would love to make an impact of um, the impact that um, transport inequality has made in Nigeria. Uh, today, like if you look at the, the the population in Lagos, for example, people would move from other states in Nigeria just to go to Lagos because, like. Um, one would recall that Lagos is one of the first African, is actually the first African um, city to have the bus rapid uh, transit. And you look at the impact that 
that uh, that system has brought, you would find that you've got a, like, um, I believe the population in Lagos today is about 15.4 million. And the size of Lagos is not like, if you compare the size of Lagos and you can compare the, the size of Rivers, uh, River State, they are like River State is much bigger than Lagos, but you've got a lot of people moving there because there's <laughs> proper, there's accessible <laughs> transport, there's also affordable transport. But just to pose a question to Daniel, is the, is the bus rapid uh, transit in, in Lagos affordable? Sorry, your question is whether it's affordable. Yeah, I think he said, yeah. Oh, OK. Um, I, I don't have a simple answer for that as one who has never, has never used. Um, I, I, I have used it for, in my opinion, it is not. I have used it a lot. I grew up in Lagos, so for me it is not. But go on, please. Yes, so I was going to say I don't I don't have a simple answer because I've never used it and so I won't be able to draw, you know, a street comparison to, so, to answer your question. But the thing, I, the thing I think to add is, I appreciate, you see, with your example that you've at least identified that there are attempts, you know, on our dear continent that have tried to ensure equity. And the BRT is a really nice example of um, something that was done in Lagos. Yeah. yeah so um, um, I, I, I was opportunity to speak to some some people, and um, especially you see, see that that COVID when the COVID hit that um, transport had to, because of they had to reduce the current capacity and transportation costs went high, it become more of a struggle for some people. Some people had to walk some distance, then enter vehicle to, to get to their destination because they could not pay the entire fare. It was so expensive. And so speaking of um, just um, transport in Lagos, um, what Daniel said and Mububu just caught, um, it made me recall a conversation I had with a student from Sierra Leone. And she, she's a literature student, and she mentioned that about a book. I, don't, I can't remember the author, but this was like years back, 20, 30 years back, whereby it took from the author's book, it took um, the lady four days to get to Lagos. So then I, I, don't, I don't know how back it was, but this is like years back, and there was no internet then, there was no like phone. So it's, it took her four days to get to Lagos. And this kind of affected her life because she didn't know what she was going to meet. And she had to, it took her a, a long time to get back to see her parents because of the, the distance to travel to Lagos. It's four days. The vehicle has to stop at each village to pick passenger because then transport was not, was not like, um, um, not much developed. So transportation actually affects everybody's life. Whether you like it or you do not like it, it affects your life. Okay, so there's a, there's a question or rather, there's a comment by Jenny Martins. I think she's referring to the um, statement that Daniel made earlier. She said, up until about 1990, there were there was very little provision for disabled travelers in Europe. What you see now, for instance, in the UK, is a result of a remarkable change in attitude and policy. Okay, so um, um, Daniel, would you want to respond to that? Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly the point. The point. Thank I'm you very much for this. Um, I, I think I think it's like I said, the, the question of um, transport equity. It's, it's an ongoing debate, you see, and there's always that improvement. We, we keep improving the model to see, um, you know, if it is fit for purpose. And if we find for any reason it's not fit for purpose with the smart tool and we try to build on improvement. Um, so, yeah, it's it's really going to be an improvement. But you see, I think I think the case with uh, most countries in Africa is that that pace is relatively slow. And this is due, in part, I would say, to a lot of problems. You see, there are challenges that may make it seem like having transport equity is not at the top of the priority list. For instance, I would say, I would say something like, so the tactile, uh, the example I gave about talking about, you know, visually impaired people and how they would travel unaccompanied, you know, in England. Um, so one infrastructure that makes that likely possible is having, you know, visual cues. Um, sorry, not visual cues per se, but um, I want to say touch sensitive cues, tactile pavements. Um, there are a lot of them at your crossing points, those studded dots you find. Um, they, want, they want the visually impaired person with a cane that is approaching a crossing or you know a hazard or whatever the case may be. So those things have been around since 1965. They've been around for a long time, for a relatively long time. But you find that 
in their application in many developing countries is not widespread. And so I would say, even if you know we are at the foundational stage, it does appear at this moment that the pace to which we are trying to catch up with developed countries is a bit slow. But yes, I do believe that, yes, um, this type of conversations were already sowing the right seeds in the minds of people. And yes, we've realized that change. OK. Um... So I'm, I'm going to ask um, a very controversial question now. So, <laughs> so if you were asked to okay pick any group of um people that you think should be the priority for in terms of equity in terms of what, what, what do you think are like priority should be given attention like now? So which group of people will you pick? I think I think your question is tricky. In the, in yeah, the, that's why I said it's so In the sense that, in the sense that it tries to underscore, if you like, <laughs> the fundamental meaning of equity. Yeah. Um, equity Equity does not try to prioritize. It tries yeah. to it tries to look at all user groups and say, um, taking all of you together, these are the type of policies. These are the type of arrangements that would work. And so I would say, to answer you simply, I would say, everyone. <laughs> Every Thank user you. Would be the priority. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um. Um. Mumbabu, do you have anything to say? We're almost calling it today. No, I I truly agree with what Daniel has said. <laughs> okay. 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 Um. So I don't think we have any more questions or comments from our audience. So um. Before. We call it today. I just want to give our speakers like a minute, two minutes. Um, what do you think? What's that word? Because I, I, I believe everybody has a part to play, not just the government. We as a society have a part to play. So any words of last words to the government? Okay, I think we have a question coming up. Give me a second, let me. Okay, she said a rising tide lifts all ships. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much, Jenny Martins. We've been um great contribution so far thank you so much thank you thank you thank you okay so um what's that word you want to give to um fellow um the policy makers the academic uh, researchers the public even the type of operators because i believe everybody has a role to play like um someone once said it's a social contract between the public and the government so yeah what's that word of encouragement or otherwise or key points or take home for the day the, for me, okay. That's please, go ahead. please go ahead. Uh, for me, um, an advice that I'd give, um, I'd give to the government um, and the public is that, um, for example, in in UK, I was privileged enough in Disability Month to um, to to join in on a webinar that. Um, uh, Jenny Martin's uh, uh, Jenny Martin's head on inclusion in terms of inclusion of dis disabled people, having and having a great organization such as the the ITS would really change our like it would really change our perceptions in terms of having a full a full view in terms of equality having a, a, a full view in, term, in terms of uh, smart, because in Africa nowadays we, we, we talk a lot about smart mobility, smart mobility, yeah. but we don't really understand what smart mobility is. But if, if we can have organizations such, such as the ITS, I believe that um, we can better implement Uh, hello, Mbubu? Hello? Okay, I think we lost him, but um, we have ITS in Nigeria, and I'm very aware of that. So I don't know about South Africa, I don't know about other countries, but I'm very aware we have ITS in Nigeria. Yeah. Okay, so Daniel, I think you want to um, give a take-home for the day? Yeah, um, I think I'm, I might have to take slightly more than two minutes, but we'll please, see how that goes. Please, that's fine. Um, yeah, the last for today, so that's fine. Yeah, so in, in ensuring that transport is for all people, you usually hear something about having the six E's, um, having education, engineering, evaluation, engagement, equity. I think I think look it up. But I think I think 
at this point where we are, um, and particularly important for Africa, but also for all countries, it's having the proper legislation in place because, and not just the legislation, also the enforcement, it's having it in place because if, if there are acts of government, if there are acts of parliaments that compel the delivery of new infrastructure or even the rehabilitation of existing infrastructure to make sure that um, um, not just infrastructure, transport projects as well, to make sure that they do consider all these elements of, uh, of um, uh, consider all users, you know, in the provision of these projects and in provision of all infrastructure. I think it would be an important starting point so that planners, so that people, contractors, they start to think of those things. I mean, if you think, if you think about buildings having ramps, to yeah, build, it wasn't it wasn't the case a few years ago. You see, but um, it has been the case of legislation that when you're bring, building building for public spaces and such things, they should have ramps for disabled users. And so I think I think legislation, strong legislation, and equally enforcement would be. Um, I think an important starting point because every other thing will trickle down from there the education the engineering of our transport to make sure it's more you know equitable and perhaps to close the thing i would like to add is because we we do we, we it did come up in a number of conversations where you say people have to walk a long distance before they get home i, I, want, <laughs> I want to say i want to say walking is not a bad thing it's um, i want to say walking is not a bad thing I mean, if we if we are going to achieve uh, transport equity and not completely lose our world, because because I mean, if you think about it, trying to make sure that public transport reaches every corner of the world and would be having so many cars, having so many buses on the road, I think I think if we are going to achieve equity in transport, we should also recognize that there has to be that diversification. Yeah. In the, exactly. modes, in the modes of transport, that uh, there has to be that modal shift. And so I would say, and, and, and this also helps nicely with issues we have around transport poverty, where because the cost of a, of a bicycle or the cost of very strong shoes for walking and running may are, are cheaper, you would agree, than what it would cost to buy a car. So, um, so yes, walking and cycling should be... Um, I'll say be considered in these things. Let's have modal shifts. Let's have let's have intelligent ideas like you know to go around the problem of transport equity. Yeah, walking is not a bad thing, but um, perhaps walking for thirteen miles to go to school is not what we want. Yeah. yeah. yeah thank you very much. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to um, Mabu. Do you want to add before I um, call it today? Do you have a last words? No, I just want to. To thank you for the great webinar. I just want to thank you also for the great um, transport uh, transport show that you've hosted. And um, I would like to thank. Uh, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just to to say this, um, I, I think I read a paper that said um, we need to understand the people to produce the kind of transport they need. You don't just produce vehicles and expect people to fit in. No, you understand the people, look at the community, look at their needs, look at oh, the context, the context of each society or each um, locality and give them what can give them the um, opportunity to go out there and fully particip participate in society. Because once um, a society do not have people participating in this, then the productivity is actually what reduced and the long run, I don't think that's sustainable. So everybody have a role to play. Everybody have something to offer. So everybody needs access, needs that um, that opportunity or that um, need transport services that give them the, the um, make it easy for them or give them the um, avenue to or to go out there and take advantage of opportunities. So um, I want to say thank you so much to Daniel. Thank you so much to Google. Thank you for our guest. Um, I'm not the one that couldn't make it. Thank you for letting me know ahead of time. And thank you for um, thank you to our, our audience. You've been very engaging. Jenny Martins, Esther, um, Shuhaib, and the rest of you, thank you so much. And so please do subscribe so that you can, you, you wouldn't miss any update and we hope you, you you can join us in our next episode thank you so much and have a good day bye